want to thank my colleagues for such great words and encouragement. Hearing it all across East Texas as I was all over the district this past week. And uh, people are encouraged when it comes to the economy. People are feeling better about the economy. I'm hearing it. They're encouraged. But after yet another school shooting, another mass shooting, I'm hearing more and more people that are asking, why? Why is this? Of course, some say, you know, the United States is the only place that uh, mass shootings occur, and of course, that's just false. Uh, there are worse mass shootings in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. Or some say if we get rid of uh, all guns in the country, then we could end the senseless violence. But when you try to tell that to people that were in Rwanda during the period when 800,000 people or so were slaughtered with machetes for the most part, um, it goes beyond the question of the weapon. Uh, we've seen airplanes used as bombs for the worst mass execution in our country's history. Of course, Pearl Harbor bombs were used, bombs themselves. We know in Oklahoma City, apparently it was anhydrous ammonia, fertilizer, we have seen the Boston bombing utilizing pressure cookers. So if the answer is to get rid of the weapons, we got to get rid of airplanes, we got to get rid of rental trucks, we got to get rid of fertilizer, got to, you know, uh, pressure cook got to go, um, machetes have got to go. They're just once you start listing the things by which people with evil intent have killed others, you realize this is an endless list. You know, there are people that have exacted violence on others all kinds of ways. And there is nothing more senseless and ignorant, and I don't mean that mean-spirited, I mean Everybody's ignorant of something. Some are just ignorant of a lot more things. But the statement that I just want Congress to do something even if it's wrong, well, that's how you lose civilizations, by doing something even if it's wrong. But there are plenty of indications, things that we can do, things we can agree on. Uh, it seems absolutely senseless that a school would know about a student who is repeatedly involved in violence, threats upon other students, threats upon other people, but actually not just threats, actual violence. But somehow... And we want to look in to see if this is really a national phenomenon that some of our schools, to avoid having uh, students continue to be arrested, that they actually try some mediation process so they avoid giving a 17, 18-year-old student an arrest record, which uh, once they have an assault uh, that is... Uh, in court, then certainly that would um, affect their ability to get a gun at all of any kind. So actually, when you start analyzing all of the ways that the system broke down and didn't work, the things that should have protected those precious lives in Parkland, Florida, Instead of saying, just do something even if it's wrong, how about if we do something that's right? How about if we do something that would actually prevent that kind of senseless violence 
from being exacted upon innocent people. I mean, we got a sheriff, and I don't know what kind of department this guy's running, but I know when there was a shooting involving a domestic case, and until terrorist activities and mass shootings started occurring, most often if there was violence at a courthouse, it was over a domestic affairs case. But I saw the video. I was already in Congress. I was no longer sitting on the bench in that courthouse. But I saw the video. And as soon as there were gunshots, those deputies, I knew them, I loved them, they were running to the sound of the gun. They didn't hunker behind anything. They ran to the sound of the gun. And that has been repeated around the country. Law officers heard a gun and they run to the sound of the gun. But apparently it appears from what we're reading that uh, uh, the sheriff there had a department that is living in pre-Columbine days. Just like before 9-11, it was thought that if your plane's hijacked, just don't create a problem. There'll be negotiation when you land somewhere. Because I still believe to this day that there were American heroes on all four of those planes. And if the first three planes had known they were going to be used as a bomb to kill others, there were Americans that would have stepped up and stopped it just like those incredibly heroic Americans did it brought down a plane in Pennsylvania. So I don't think it'll ever happen again. There will always be people who love this country and love life so much that they would give theirs to save so many others. That's what Jesus said is the greatest love. And clearly the fourth flight had that. But you look, here's a story from the Florida Sun Sentinel, and it talks about, well, school shooter Nicholas Cruz, an unending saga of disturbed behavior and red flags, written by Brittany Wallman, Paula McMahon, Megan O'Matz, Susanna Bryan, and they document this, that he did things like, uh, well, of course, we know, apparently, he didn't know his father. Uh, he knew his adopted father. Of course, his adopted father and mother had died, but apparently they had a wonderful home, swimming pool, lots of comforts. But he didn't have moral a moral compass at all. Apparently threatened his mother, threatened his brother, violence on his brother, least threatened violence on his own mother. Um, and we know from this article, at least, it says the the, the uh, adopted father, Mr. Cruz, didn't own any guns. But Nicholas, uh, he uh, was diagnosed as having a string of disorders, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, emotional behavior disability, and autism. Uh, his mom told the sheriff's deputies he also had obsessive compulsive disorder and anger issues. He had counselors in school and at home, according to DCF records. Um, he, he took medications. Don't know what all medications he took. Maybe there was some relationship there. We ought to uh, be able to discern how many of these people have taken different types of drugs and which one were they. We know... Uh, there seems to be a correlation between people committing suicide. Many of the medications that are prescribed to kids who feel troubled. Uh, this article says that Nicholas was a mama's boy, and yet he threatened his mother. His mother called the police to say he got physical with his brother and with her. 
Sounds like a physical assault on his mother. My late mother was close to five foot. I was a lot bigger than she was in high school, but uh, whew, I knew not to even think about raising a hand. When he was 14, his mother reported he had hit her with a plastic hose from a vacuum cleaner. A few months later, she told deputies he had thrown her against the wall because she took away his Xbox gaming system. A year later, she told deputies Nicholas had punched the wall after she took away his Xbox. Uh, foul language, insults, disobedience, disruption. Cruz's behavior was exactly what school teachers frowned upon. Uh, he went to a different school for a while, which offered a program for emotionally and behaviorally disabled children. Uh, but according to the article, gee, he, Cruz, could not control himself. Now, it talked about uh, in the article that uh, he was five foot seven, 120 pounds, but I know a lot about being bullied up through junior high, up through eighth grade, because I was very small. I didn't start growing until high school of any size. May have been the smallest guy on our football team. Uh, first couple of years in high school, I know a lot about getting bullied. I know a lot about getting my nose bloodied. Never killed anybody. Um, I had parents that would make all four of us kids quite angry, but they taught us respect of authority. They disciplined us. And they made sure we were in Sunday school and church every week. You know, it looks like <clears throat> the school and the community and the sheriff's office all helped Ms. Cruz and Nicholas, and I use help loosely, avoid having a criminal record that would have prevented him from having a gun and would have prevented him from killing 17 people. At least it'd be a whole lot more difficult without a gun like he had. But they all worked together unknowingly. Of course, it was not intentionally. They thought they were helping him. And what they were doing, what was coming down the road, was a disaster of massive proportions. We do need to do something that prevents this in the future. Some say, well, it's time to end the personal transfer loophole. So a, a father can't give a son a weapon. Well, perhaps if Nicholas's father had taught him, um, got a friend from Florida I was visiting with this, this weekend, and he said the worst whipping that he ever got was when he pointed a gun, his grandfather's gun, at his brother. He never did that again. And I'm not advocating violence on kids. I know the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. But as a judge, a felony judge, I've seen kids be abused beyond propriety, justified criminal penalty. But we could take some action, it would seem, that would prevent... Entities, whether it's the Air Force, whether it's the Broward School System, the Broward County Sheriff's Office, from preventing someone from avoiding appropriately having a criminal record that would prohibit them getting a gun. 
That way we're talking about something that would prevent this same thing from happening. When it comes to the personal transfer of weapons, as John Locke was saying the other day, in over 100 years, there has not been a mass shooting that involved a gun received in a personal transfer, whether it's from father, son, friend, friend. And of course, if there's somebody at a gun show that is not having a background check and they're selling more than one weapon there, there's a good chance they're committing a crime. It's not a loophole at a gun show. Anybody that's there selling guns needs to have the background check done, and they do. And you can't get the gun until it's gone through a proper background check and you get it from someone who ensures that everything is followed. I won a gun at an auction. Uh, some I've heard some people say, yeah, we got to stop that too, getting a gun at an auction. I had to go through the background check. I had to pick it up at a store. I felt sorry for the store, but there are stores that guns that are constantly having to clear somebody that bought it online because you cannot pick up that gun until the background check is done and you go to someone who has ensured the background check is done done, and then getting the weapon. So that seems to be something we could do. And then something we were talking to some of our Freedom Caucus tonight, you know, and uh, uh, unlike the no-fly list where the Obama administration would not tell us how you got on it and would not give us any idea on how you appeal, how you get off, and we would plead for some people that were law-abiding, shouldn't have been on there, and sometimes they get off, sometimes they don't. But we as Congress... House and Senate need to pass a bill that sets up a due process where if you're on the no-fly list, you can appeal and get off. We ought to make it where if you've had been guilty of assaults, whether in school or um, in the home, as Nicholas Cruz was, or whether it's uh, in public, That ought to prevent you from getting a gun. And, of course, domestic situations, things often get so heated. I've seen terrible charges alleged against a father or mother during the course of a a divorce. And that is something the state legislature could deal with. If it involves some federal entity, it's something we could deal with and say this is how you could appeal and get an unjust decision blocking a gun purchase. But uh, we also know that those people that say, hey, there have been three million people who shouldn't buy guns that have been blocked from buying guns, well, they don't know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is there aren't but just a few dozen people that get prosecuted out of three million Someone told me yesterday it was only a few dozen of the three million they're ever prosecuted for uh, improperly request or, or filing for a gun. Um, yeah, there may have been three million people denied, but it turns out there were mistakes because of the ways in which the names are checked. You really want to get to the bottom line, Mr. Speaker. John Adams was president in 1898. Some of these very issues kept coming up. The people that founded this country, they were better read than most students are today, even after college. And even those that didn't believe the Bible They quoted it. And in fact, in this very room and in the room right down the hall where the United States House of Representatives. The 
the Bible during sessions was the most quoted book in our history. In here, in that room, in the Senate down the hall, the old Senate, the current Senate, the Bible was the most quoted book in our history. And there would seem to be good reason within the Bible itself find the words for the word of God is a living and powerful is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart John Adams was president after two terms under President George Washington under our current constitution he knew precisely what the Constitution said. He knew how it had come about. He was vice president, president of the Senate, uh, when the Bill of Rights were created. He was part of that process. Yet John Adams explained President John Adams explained in 1898 the bottom line that people in this country have got to understand if we are going to address the kind of violence that is sparked around this country. John Adams explained it. His words were more than prescient. They are perpetually true as long as we're operating under this Constitution. As he said, knowing, having read many times every word of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights helped generate these Bill of Rights. He knew what they were. But he's our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You want to know where the answer is? If people are going to be safe in America, we have a choice. We either start anew teaching morality, teaching that there is a right or wrong, that not everything is relative. And even if those who don't believe there is a God don't want to hear about it, it's okay to talk about God. You don't have to believe it. Look at Jefferson's words. He made clear. You know, of course, it always amazed me how he could put the biggest grievance in the original declaration against King George was ever allowing slavery. So on the one hand, he could see the problems created for America by ever allowing the inhumanity of man to man. But he talked about the best hope being the teaching of the Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, that we should be teaching those, the best hope for America. But if we're going to be safe, we either got to teach morality, encourage religion, not force secular humanism, on American, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to teach about it. In fact, these studies I saw as a felony judge repeatedly indicated the best hope of cutting recidivism of criminals is if they go through a intensive Christian Bible study in prison so afraid of talking about the Bible, so afraid of talking about Christianity. I don't have to have it. There's no official religion in this country, 
But as the Supreme Court said, at the end of the 19th century, this is a Christian nation. Not everybody was Christian, of course, but it was founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs. It was founded on the Bible, and that's the reason Moses' face, full face, is up there in the middle because he was felt to be the best lawgiver in the history of the world. Obviously, Supreme Court doesn't think so much anymore. We have a choice. Teach morality encourage religion or in order to be safe we got to give up the second amendment we've already given up parts of the second amendment in 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 a part of it we've given up part of our freedom of assembly we've given up part of our freedom of speech we've given up a big hunk of freedom of religion because this constitution was only meant to govern a moral and religious people. And unless we're willing to start teaching morality again, we have no hope of being safe under the current constitution. I pray to God and it prayers can work. God will in heaven. I pray to God that people will wake up and we won't have to discharge different parts of our constitutional rights in order to remain safe. And I look at the interior of this Bible that belonged to my uncle. It's a New Testament on the front, in the grave, in the metal. May the Lord be with you. He had it in World War II. But inside, at the top, it says, The White House, Washington. As Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in this sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. Signed, Franklin D. Roosevelt. That is not a mistake that President Roosevelt made. It needs to be one we don't make either. And with that, I yield back.